belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. turn it for good you turn it for good come on you take and you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good he's turning Come on for the battle. battle. Hallelujah belongs to you, Lord. Sing that again. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Show you my weakness. Come on, my 
failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Oh, the God of the mountain. Come on, he's the God of the valley. He's the God of the valley. There's not a place. There's not a place. That his mercy and grace won't find me again. Yeah. 
there's nothing oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better Well, we all know there's nothing better than the Lord who had mercy upon us. Amen. Mercy upon mercy. Grace upon grace. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we give you thanksgiving from our heart. Lord, that you have blessed us, Lord God, to live as free men and women. Lord God, not free because of the country we live in, but free because the Word says, whom the Son is made free is free indeed. Lord God, that you have delivered us from the power of tyranny of the enemy. Lord, we thank you today for your blessings and we give you praise. Lord, honor and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, praise team, well, thank you for leading us into a wonderful time of praise and worship. And we're just going to worship the Lord. You may be seated today. And, uh, the boys and girls are going with Miss Amy over to the children's ministry. And we appreciate that. Let's give them a hand this morning. Yeah. Amen. And uh, teenagers are going to stay in here. No, they're going to stay in here. All right. Well, God is good. Amen. And I know that everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving because I all asked you. And you ate too much, and we'll have an altar call for those that need. Now, God is good. We thank God for His blessings. Amen. You know, every good and every perfect gift comes from above. It comes from, from our God, who's the Father of light. Amen. And, and we thank God for His goodness and mercy to us. He is a faithful God. Amen. And uh, we, we take the opportunity today to, to enter into the presence of the Lord. Amen. To, to let God, you know, if you, you came to hear me say a few words, then you came for the wrong reason. But if you came to encounter God, if you came to have an experience with God, then you're you're in the right place because the Spirit of the Lord is present to meet any need you have. You may have a, a material need. You may have, a, a, you know, a spiritual need. Whatever it is, God is able, more than able, to meet any need you have. And, you know, we, we miss many. There's those that are traveling. But I'm glad you're here this morning, that you came because you love the Lord. You know, there's a lot of places you could be <coughs> today, but thank God that you're here today and we have a word that I believe is from the Lord for you today. And our thought today is don't give the devil an open door to your life. Too many Christians, whether on purpose or not, they, they leave the door open to the devil. Now, you know, I know it's not intentional, <coughs> but that happens. And the devil is more than willing to come in and mess your life up. So uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 4 and 27. It says, neither give place to the devil. We can say we don't give the devil any room to enter our life. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for those that are present. Lord, to hear your word, we praise you for the Holy Spirit who is present. Lord, to meet every need we have. And we thank you today that the Holy Spirit will minister life, Lord God, that we, we have the abundant life. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed us with abundance, Lord God, in every, every part of our life. Lord God, we have abundant health. We have abundant life. Lord, we have abundant supply. That, Lord, you're more than enough, and you meet every need we have. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And I want to um, say with Brother, Brother uh, Mark, Tuesday night, we have prayer. And uh, we've had some wonderful answers to prayer. Uh, you know, uh, Brother Jason, uh, he gets his poured out. His, you know, we prayed for his kidneys to, uh, to, to, to function. And Miss Carolyn back there has been taking care of him. And, and she told him, she told him, don't worry, you know, uh, your, your kidneys will function again, you know, because, you know, if your kidneys stop working, you know, that's a concern, especially if you have to go di dialysis a couple of times a week. And, you know, that process takes a lot out of you. 
and say, you know, I'm sure the devil was working on his man. You know, you're going to be this way forever. You know, all these bad things have happened to you. But thank God for an answer to prayer. We thank the Lord that God has ministered uh, to him and, and for healing. And, and, and Brother Mark talked about the person that had, had COVID and, you know, not expected to live. But our God is more than enough. He hears and answers every prayer. Even, you know, if he knows the, every bird that falls in the sky, how many birds are there on this planet? Well, we don't know. There's a lot of birds. But God knows every, every sparrow. The Bible says every sparrow that falls from the sky. Well, you know, he knows the number of your uh, hairs on your head. You, you couldn't hazard a guess how many hairs you have on your head. But God knows all those things. Because he's the almighty God. He knows everything. He, he created the heavens and the earth. You know, that's a lot of theories. And that's all they are is, uh, you know, uh, people have a theory about how the universe started. Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 exactly how it started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's long before any of us were here. Uh, you know, last week we were talking about when the pilgrims landed, there wasn't a holiday inn they could check into. They, they, there weren't anything. And they could have never imagined the day in which we live. There's no way. We, we have automobiles, we have roads, we have skyscrapers, we have uh, trains, we have planes. And, and, you know, over time those things came into existence. But, you know, there was a time when trains didn't exist. There, there wasn't any train travel. But, you know, we live in a glorious day because we live in the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's important for us uh, in these last days to share the Word of God. You know, part of what we come to do is to be equipped with the Word of God so that we have some ammunition. When somebody asks uh, about our, our life and our condition, we can answer them with the Word of God. Amen? You know, your opinion doesn't amount to, to a whole lot. Everybody has an opinion about something, but the Word of God stands forever. You know, I lived in a day and a time... When, uh, when we left the doors open. I lived out in the country. Now, I was born in 1950. I'm, I'm an old guy. But I was born in 1950, and I can't remember ever my grandfather and grandmother ever locking their doors. You didn't do that. My, I, I, you know, we might have shut the door at, at my dad's house, but I don't ever remember us locking the door because we lived in a time when we didn't fear anybody. You know, there wasn't anybody going to bother us. My grandfather drove a bus for many years, and out front, he, he had, a, a, had a gas pump. And uh, on, his, on his porch, you'd cut the electricity on and, and pump gas. And everybody in the community knew the gas was there. And uh, he didn't have anybody come by and fill up their car. You know, of course, gas was about uh, 20 cents a gallon back there. You know, not, not like it is today. It's $3 a gallon plus. You know, it's a different world in which we live. But, but we, we didn't, you know, we didn't worry about leaving the door open. But when it comes to your spiritual life, when it comes to your personal life, it's important that you keep the door shut to the devil. And, you know, sometimes we do it, we don't intend to leave the door open. You know, uh, my wife used to, she said, did you lock the door? Well, you know, she wanted to make sure that the house was secure. Well, you know, any lock is only secure against people that are honest. What are you doing to keep the honest people honest? A, a crook can find a way in your house. We have a sliding glass door in the back, backyard that faces the back that, you know, anybody wanted in, all they have to do is bust the glass and come on in. But we, you know, you keep the honest people honest. And so it may not be your intention. You may be here today and you wonder why the devil is affecting your life is because you may have left a door open to him. And so we're going we're gonna to give you the word of God. We're going to give you the ability through the power of God to shut the door to the devil so the devil, you know, doesn't come into your life. Now, you know, the, the devil is a thief. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But, but... He doesn't have access to your life because you're a believer. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're no longer under his authority. And, he, and uh, unless you open the door to him, he doesn't have a way into your life. So you have to be careful to keep all the doors and windows shut. Keep the devil shut out of your life. So that's why the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He didn't write that to sinners. He wrote that to the church. He said, you need to give the devil no place. You know, Jesus, and, and talking to Peter, he said, I prayed for you. Because Jesus said the devil came looking for a place, an entrance into my life. He didn't find it. Because there was no way in. 
the devil tried. He was frustrated. You know, we, we have the, the story of how that the devil tempted him in the beginning. And, uh, you know, we have when he comes out of the temptation. We don't know what took place in the 40 days uh, in the wilderness. And the, the devil had tried everything to get a, a, a hold on the life of Jesus Christ. And we, when he comes out, we see that Jesus is hungry. So he said, if you're really the Son of God, uh, turn these stones to bread. Now, if Jesus could not have done that, you know, that wouldn't have been a temptation. You could have said, well, I can't turn stones to bread. But because he had the power of the Holy Spirit, he could have done that. And uh, that would have been wrong for him to do that. You know, uh, the devil took him to the pinnacle and he, and he quoted scripture. He says, you know, uh, and in fact, he had quoted scripture in all these instances. He said, you know, if you jump off of here, uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, the angels are going to catch you. And because the Bible says you won't dash your foot against a stone. And, and, and Jesus said, I'm not going to, you know, you don't tempt the Lord your God. In other words, you don't do things that you know that it's wrong to do. Amen? And so that ought to be a lesson to all of us. There's some things that we know that we shouldn't do, so don't do them. Amen? You know, but by not doing those things, you shut the door to the devil. You know, the devil was looking for a way into the life of Jesus. He couldn't find it. And Jesus said, the devil's looking for a way into your life, Peter, but I prayed for you. And, uh, you know, it would have been a whole lot worse for Peter had not all happened. In the book of Colossians, it says this. Colossians 1, 12 and 4, uh, through 14 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. You know, we don't use that word today. We could say able able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. You're a saint of God. When you receive Jesus Christ in your life, the, the Lord has called you saints. You know, there, there's a church, and, and they have a saint for everything. And uh, that's wonderful. But you are a saint of God. When you receive Jesus Christ, uh, God has allowed you to become a, a, a saint, a child of God in life. It goes on, who has delivered us? God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. God has delivered us out of the tyranny of the devil, uh, out of the kingdom of darkness. Everybody was in that kingdom. I, I don't care how good a life you live. Everybody was in that kingdom because you were born in that kingdom. The only way you were getting out, uh, was the delivering power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could do everything. You know, those people have done everything in the world to, to redeem their life, but God had one redemptive plan. It was the blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, that came and died for us that we might have life and have that more abundantly. And so God, uh, His grace and mercy has delivered us, and we're delivered by the power of dark, from the power of darkness, and we've been brought over in the kingdom of uh, of God's dear Son. You know, there's a process by which you can adopt a child. And uh, adopted children have a stronger legal standing than your natural children. Uh, it, it is that my grandmother was adopted. And uh, she didn't understand that she had a stronger legal standing as far as the property that, that they would inherit. She had a stronger legal standing than, than her uh, half-brother, who was, you know, really heir to everything. Uh, her mother and her stepfather uh, had a child, and, uh, you know, that was their flesh and blood. But she had a stronger standing because she was adopted in that family. Brother, Brother Tommy adopted uh, Hunter and Julian, and uh, they have a stronger standing. And I love Nick. But they have a stronger standing than Nick has, even though Nick is their biological child. But because they're adopted, they have a stronger legal standing. You've been adopted into the kingdom of God. God adopted you by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and made you his child. You moved out of darkness into the kingdom of light, and everything that, that Jesus inherits, it belongs to you. You have a strong standing in the Lord. And, and, you know, the devil doesn't want you to know that, that you have a strong standing. You know, somewhere in Battle Creek, Michigan, the family fortune lies. I didn't find out about the family fortune until about, oh, maybe 10 years ago. My uncle was alive, and uh, uh, the, the stepbrother of my grandmother came down to visit and had a son. 
And his son kept saying, Boy, I can't wait till daddy passes away. He said, Boy, that's terrible. Say that. He said, I'll inherit the family fortune. And he said, Well, can't be much. A few farms. He said, Oh, no. Uh, when they divided their property, my grandmother took the property down here. And he said, Well, you don't know much about that up there. I'll tell you what, you have this and I'll take that. Well, that should have been a, a, a warning sign to her. She sold, he sold to Catalog Cornflakes. Uh, about a 10-acre farm for what was back in the 1950s, $5 million. And uh, he never told anybody about that. And, and so he was very wealthy. He became wealthy overnight but because of a little transaction there. But see, my grandmother had a strong standing. She could have said, no, we're going to equally divide that. But she was ignorant to the law. My point is, you can be ignorant to the law of adoption that God has adopted you and you have the rights and the privileges that belong to you as a part of the kingdom of God. That the devil doesn't have authority over you. Now, you know, the devil will take advantage of your ignorance and, uh, you know, he, he will try to have dominion over you. But you've been adopted into the family of God. In Romans 6, 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Well, sin and the devil both cannot have authority over you. It, it's, it's not right. You know, I, I, I like everybody here. We were, how many, everybody in here born in the United States of America? You know, I can say, how many are taxpayers? We all pay taxes and we grumble about paying taxes. But uh, do any of you pay taxes in France? Or Spain? No, because you're not a citizen of that country. You, you weren't born there. You don't live there. You don't have citizenship. We pay taxes in America. You know, there was a time when Jesus was with Peter, and, and Peter said, I, I think I made a boo-boo. I'm paraphrasing. And, they, and he said, Lord, I, I, they asked me if we pay taxes. And I said, yes. And Jesus said, well, we don't pay taxes here. But I'm going to bail you out. He said, I'm going to bail you out, Peter. He said, you go fishing, and the first fish you catch, you take the coin in his mouth and pay your taxes and my taxes. And because he didn't want to have anybody to have a reason that Jesus, uh, you know, well, Jesus shorted me or Jesus cheated me. He went over, overboard to protect him. So we are citizens of America, and so we pay taxes in America. We, we are under the authority of, of the U.S. government, you know, and, and we've seen that in the, in the last year. Uh, there's things that have been done that, that they don't, you know, they just don't jive with the Constitution. I saw Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on the other day, and he said, you know, we close churches down without any discussion. He said, that's a, that's a right of, uh, of one of the First Amendment rights is to have church, to have church regardless of the uh, denomination. But he said, we just shut them down in some parts of the country. You know, we were shut down here for two or three weeks that we, we didn't have church. Why? Because the governor said... It's not essential. And, uh, you know, later on they decided churches were essential. You know, it is, we didn't have any discussion about it, and, and we complied because the power over us said that we're supposed to do that. Well, you know, the devil will try to take authority in your life, and if you let him, he will. Right. You know, the devil says, well, you're, you're sick and you're getting sicker, and if you side in with him, guess what? You're sick and getting sicker. Right. The devil says, well, you know, you're not supposed to have anything. You know, people have misinterpreted the Bible where Jesus told a rich young ruler one day, you know, he said, you know, he asked him, well, what about the command? Oh, I kept all those. Man, I kept all those. I got those covered. Jesus said, well, you like one thing. Go sell what you have and give it to the poor. Why? Because Jesus knew his heart. His possessions had him. And, and he's, he went away sorrowful because he couldn't do that. He, he couldn't sell his possessions to follow Jesus. Well, Jesus is offering him the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, the, the Bible says that on the foundations of heaven, the names of the apostles. I mean, he, he could have his name written in heaven. How much would you pay to have that? How much, you know, what is that worth to you as a believer? Well, you know, I just want to get inside the gate. I want my, I've got to find my name on the road. Amen. I'll be satisfied. But, you know, it was reserved for those to have that. But he passed an opportunity. But people misinterpret that. They think, well, to serve God, you can't have anything. You know, well, if that was true, we wouldn't be able to do anything for God. 
you know, you, 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 if you didn't have anything, you know, how could you pay your tithe? Well, I, I can't make it. You know, I don't have anything to give. I wish I could, but I can't. You know, we can support missionaries. Uh, we support missionaries all over the world. Other churches do. Why? Because we, we have things. Amen? And, and some people have more than others. That's, that's wonderful. We live in America that we have the opportunity to, to uh, create and, and, and make wealth. My, my little granddaughter has those little things, you know, little push things. I don't know what you call them. You know, uh, poppers, yeah. And, uh, you know, that came from, uh, from the uh, uh, popper things, you know, uh, the, uh, where they, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what you, packing, packing, you know, packing things, where they, they pop those. You know, if you didn't invented that, you'd say, hey, I got an idea, we'll make one that'll pop. You'd be a millionaire. Why didn't you think of that, Sister Moffitt? I'm telling you, miss, miss my opportunity. No, you know, there's plenty of opportunity. All I'm making this point is that there's an opportunity. See, the grace of God is God's part. Actually, both parts of God. Faith is our part. We believe God. And if we believe God, the Bible says Abraham believed God. Well, you know, Abraham didn't have this book here. I mean, he's, he's learning as he goes. And he trusts God. First thing he does, he leaves the earth of the Chaldees, takes his family. Where are you going? Well, I don't know, but, but God is going to show me. And he doesn't know where he's going. God says, leave your family behind. He takes his father and, and he takes uh, uh, his uh, brother's kids with him. And so there's an entourage they leave. And, and his father dies. And now, you know, he has luck. Well, God said, leave your family behind. And eventually, they parted ways because Lot's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Abraham had an argument. And, and, and Lot became the peacemaker. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemaker. And, and so Lot said, look, you choose. He could have said, well, now I'm choosing. I, I'm, a, I'm God's friend. I'm going to choose. But he said, Lot, you choose. And Lot looks around. And he sees the lush valley down there. He said, I'll choose this, and you take whatever. Well, you know, he didn't leave good pasture land for, for Abraham. But, you know, God so abundantly supplied Abraham, and Abraham did well. Why? Because he has the favor of God upon his life. And uh, eventually, Lot ends up in uh, uh, Sodom, and Abraham has to rescue him. God's going to destroy the whole thing. God said, i got to talk to my covenant partner. And it is that God tells Abraham. And Abraham said, wait a minute. You know, if you can find a hundred down there, can you spare the city? Well, you know, and, and, and they go. The angel says, there's not a hundred. Well, he said, well, what about 50? And, you know, he gets down to 10, and, and, and the angel says, there's not 10 in here. And so Lot quits. God didn't quit. Lot quit. I mean, Abraham quit. He quit interceding for the city. But God said... I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bring your family out. And the angels go in and they bring Lot and his family out. And, and the angels said, will not you look back? And we know the story how Lot's wife, she looked up. One more look. And that was fatal because the Bible says she was turned to a pillar of salt. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. I saw a documentary. Somebody thought they had found Sodom and Gomorrah. They found, you know, the, the, the brimstone balls. And, you know, I don't know whether they found it or not because it's dust. I mean, it, it looks like dust. They may have found it, may not. Grace is God's part. God had grace, had compassion upon you. You know, when Jesus died, it's 2,000 years almost before I come into the world. But God knew I would be here. God knew you would be here and had compassion upon you to, to save you by His grace. God didn't have to do that. He's God. You know, in, in the garden, He could have said, well, you, you've sinned, you messed up, and He could have done away with Adam and Eve, and we wouldn't have known a thing in the world about it. God could have raised up other people, but He didn't do it because God never failed. Love never fails. And God says, I love you with my love. And so he tells Eve, he said, I'm going to send a deliverer. Well, you know, the devil knows that every time God speaks something, it happened. So he, immediately he's looking for a deliverer. And, uh, you know, uh, Abel, God accepts the sacrifice of Abel, not Cain. He said, that must be the guy. And so he causes uh, Cain to kill Abel. 
And, and, and Jesus said all the prophets that came and all those that came before, you killed them all. Why? Because the devil wanted to kill the one that was coming. Now, you know, we're in the, in the Christmas season. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. He probably wasn't born on December the 25th. But you know, the devil didn't know anything about the birth of Jesus until the wise men came. It was a surprise to him. And uh, he has to learn second-handed. And, uh, you know, the, the, the scribes come in and they say, yeah, it says right here in the Bible, in the scroll, that, 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 that Bethlehem of Judea. And, and well, he knows uh, that somewhere over in Bethlehem is the one he's looking for. But he doesn't know who Jesus is, so he has the king, who's a wicked king, order that everybody two years and under, every male child is going to be killed. Well, God was way ahead of him because God had already told Joseph, take the child and go down to Egypt to fulfill Scripture. That's another, another message. See, faith is our part. Well, see, God gave you the faith. He gave you the grace and gave you the faith. God is trying to get you out of trouble. He wants to help you. See, we're saved by faith. Hey, we're delivered from the authority of the devil by the grace of God. By grace are you saved through faith, that not ourselves. It is a glorious gift of God. See, God has given grace to every person on this planet. But a lot of people haven't received that. You know, those people on this planet never heard that Jesus ever came the first time. Now, we think about that. We think, well, how could that be? There are people that live in remote areas. You, you ever been where you have no cell service? Everybody's had that experience. No cell service. We think the world's come to an end. Especially if you're 15 years old. I can't get on Facebook. I can't, I, I can't, I can't communicate with my friends. Well, there's places in the world, they don't have electricity. They don't have television. They don't have the afternoon. They don't have, they, 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 most of them are, are, are sheep herders, are, are goat herders. They live in the mountains. And nobody comes up there. And they don't know Jesus came the first time. You know, God is full of grace and mercy. Now, how's God going to deal with them people? Well, I really don't know, but I know this. God is fair, honest, and he will deal with them in an honest and equitable way. But you know, there'll still be people that reject the Lord. You know, there are a lot of people that live times past. How in the world is God going to be fair to them? Well, I don't know, but God's going to be fair to them. God is a God of grace and mercy. He's not, the Bible says, He's not willing that anybody perish. Now, there's some folks we let perish. You know, Adolf Hitler would be on the top of the list. Some of those folks, they were so heinous. Well, that is the devil. They were operating the way the devil operates. They, you know, the devil wanted to kill all the Jews. Because if he could get rid of the Jews, it'd be hard for God to fulfill the Scripture that says he's going to raise up. You know, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees, the, you know, the bones, and they come together, and he said, well, these bones live again. He said, Lord, I don't know, but you do. Now, we know that they came back uh, from Babylonian captivity, but God's talking about the total destruction of Israel. And that happened. You know, that happened, and it's a miracle. If you, if you research the history of Israel uh, after the Second World War, you will find that it's a miracle that God called them from all over the world. And there are people today that are the Jews that want to come to Israel. Now, you say, we, we call them Jews. Well, that's because that, that name Jew is, is a, a short version of the tribe of Judah. But we, there were 11 other tribes. Paul said he was of the tribe of Benjamin. But we, we call Israelites Jews because of the line or the tribe of Judah. Because the devil's only interested in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if he could overcome the, the, the power of God, he can't do it. But he's trying. You know, he, 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 he continually tries to, to stop God. You know, it, it, the devil is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I mean, the devil is really stupid. But he continually tries. You know, the Bible says he's going to be bound for a thousand years. You think a thousand years of solitary, he'd figure out, well, you know, I just can't do it. But when he's loose, he's going to go and gather up folks that don't like the Lord, and he's going to bring an army against the Lord, and he's going to be destroyed. And then the end comes 
will, will the great white throne judgment come? But, you know, the devil doesn't change. See, you don't walk this Christian walk. You can't walk this walk without the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave you grace and He gave you faith to walk. And we're not perfect in our walk. Everybody in here, we make mistakes. But God, you know, He's faithful to help us. You know, sometimes we're like a little child. You ever, ever see a little child when they learn to walk? You know, they, they, they get up, they get up and they bounce, and then they do this wobble thing. You know, and they do this little bouncing thing. Well, they're, they're, they're getting used to that bounce. And what a wonderful day when they take off. Because they have advanced. They quit crawling and now they're walking. Of course, that, that causes other problems because then they're, in, they're into everything. They want to investigate. But it's a wonderful problem because you're that much nearer to getting up out of diapers. Now, some of you didn't have the pleasure of cloth diapers like my wife did, but that was a great day when ours, uh, you know, uh, didn't have to wear diapers anymore. It was a wonderful day. I come in one day, my wife was shouting. I said, what happened? She said, we don't have to have diapers anymore. You know, it is that when we move in the grace of God, we move beyond uh, the stage that we're a child. You know, we are all the children of God, but we grow up and we mature in the things of God, and we learn how uh, to shut the door on the devil. You know, our Heavenly Father has taken and empowered us to take back everything the devil has stolen from us. You know, in the book of Exodus, it tells us, 14th chapter, it tells about the exodus of the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. Now, there was no way they were ever leaving Egypt. Number one, they didn't have an army. The Egyptians had an army. Moses served in the Egyptian army. He was a general. You read the, the history. Josephus talks about the fact that, 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 that Moses, you know, he was, a, he was a next in line to be the Pharaoh. I mean... He was the fair-haired child of, of Egypt. But that wasn't what God called him to be. And the, and the people that live in Egypt today are not the same people that lived back then. whole different group of people. They may be born in Egypt, but they're not the same people. And, and so it is that God has caused us to receive. Now, you know, they were there for about 400 years. What if your boss didn't pay you for a year? How would you make it? Well, they, they, they had a little substance. The Pharaoh kept them going so they could work. They made bricks, and, and they did all the building for the Pharaoh, but they didn't have anything. And, and God said to Abraham, said, I'm going to bless you. And those that curse you, I'm going to curse. So God delivers the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He uses all these plagues. And, you know, they, they try to equal all of them, but they, they can't do everything God does. You know, Moses threw, threw his uh, rod down and became a serpent. Well, you know, they walked around with snakes in their hand, and they'd throw them down, and they became, you know, like that. But, but Moses' serpent swallowed all of them, and when he picked it up, it became a stick again. That, that, that should have told them something. You know, the Nile River became uh, like blood. And, and they couldn't, the only folks that had good drinking water were the, were the Israelites. Plague didn't follow them. It affected everybody else. And, and God delivered them by a mighty hand. The last plague was the firstborn uh, of, of all the people in the livestock died. And uh, they said, loan us it. We'll do anything. What, what do you want? Anything, you come in here and get it. We want, they, they were ready to get rid of them. The Pharaoh said, go. Well, a few days later, he thinks about, it. who's going to bail my stuff? He says, I'll go out there and I'll, I'll bring them back. And by that time, they're, they're crossing the Red Sea. And God stands between them so they can cross. There's a, there's a wall of fire. The glory of God standing between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Why? Because God said, those that curse you, I will curse. Those that bless you, I will bless. I will fight for you. And so God is fighting for them. And so they can't get through. And when the last Israelites has crossed, God opens the gate. Well, if you want to go into the sea, you go right ahead. But the power of God was not there to part the sea for them. And the seas collapsed on them. And they all died. 
And the, the Israelites were delivered completely from the bondage and the authority of Egypt. Wow, they didn't have any more authority. The army's gone and the Pharaoh's gone. Who's, who's going to exercise any authority over you? You're, you're on the other side of the Red Sea. How are they going to get across here? The same way that Jesus has delivered us from the authority of darkness, he did the same thing for us at the cross. Jesus suffered and died for us. He submitted himself. The Bible tells us that we ought to be submitted to God. Submit yourself to the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil even he will flee from you. Jesus submitted himself to the death of the cross. And it wasn't something that Jesus was just jumping up and down to do, but he went. He went because that was a plan of God. He submitted to the death of the cross. And as horrible as that was, then he is pulled into the bowels of the earth. And he's in another realm. He should have went to the bosom of Abraham, but the devil had a hold of him. He, and, and uh, you know, he held a hold of him until the Holy Spirit came. And then he wished he didn't have a hold of him because the Lord triumphed over him and made a show, and show of him before all that were present, uh, all in the spirit realm that saw that Jesus Christ is the King of kings. And he took the authority that belonged to the devil. Well, you say, well, how does the devil have authority over the people in the earth? Everybody in here at some point in time seen somebody intoxicated whether with alcohol or drugs. And, and, and people that are intoxicated, they're not in the right mind. You know, I can remember as a kid uh, seeing people that were intoxicated, kids my age, and they do some of the craziest things you've ever, ever seen in your life. And I'm not going to say what they were. But, but they, in their right mind, if they had a clear mind, they'd have never done that. But because they were intoxicated, somebody said, do this, and they did it. And uh, it didn't work out too well for them because they were intoxicated. They weren't thinking right. The, the Bible says that the devil has clouded the minds. In other words, people in the world are intoxicated. They believe all kinds of things. They're, they're, they're people that they believe in Buddha. Well, Buddha can't do anything for you. They believe in Muhammad. Muhammad can't do anything for you. The only one that can do anything for you is the Lord Jesus Christ, who's redeemed us. And so, so the devil has reign over the people in the world that are intoxicated. They're under the influence of the devil. And so they, they do devilish things. And if they, they, they you know, the, the glorious light of the gospel comes to them, they would change. You know, we, uh, we have seen the men and women of Teen Challenge that when Jesus came in, the devil went out. And they live a life for God. See, the devil doesn't have any dominion and authority over you. You know, if, if we made a list of sins that, that we think of the sins, our, 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 our probably would call, start with murder and robbery and kidnapping. Those are the sins that we would think about. But God in the book of Revelations, in Revelation 21 and 8, it says, But the fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, saucers, and all, well, he lists the fearful and the unbelieving first. Well, we, you know, I don't know whether fear would be on our top ten. But God says fear. You know, most people in the world and, and Christians are affected by fear. You know, fear comes natural to us as a human being because our great, 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 great grandpa, Adam, when he submitted to the devil, he received the same spirit the devil had, the spirit of fear. And when God comes in in the afternoon, well, God knew what he did. And he's calling for Adam. He said, well, what are you hiding over behind that bush? He said, I was afraid. Fear. Well, you know, God's a God of faith. Everything God, God says is by faith. God speaks by faith. That's the reason sometimes we misunderstand God because God calls the things to be not as though they were. You know, if he says he's going to do something for you, and you don't understand how God speaks, you can make a mistake because you think, well, God's going to do this right now. No, but when God says it, it's going to happen because God said it. That's the reason God has never called you a sinner because if God says you're a sinner, there's no hope for you. There's only one hope, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we were all sinners. The Bible says we were sinners, how lost and undone without God. See, God begins his list with fear. 
and, and unbelief and doubt. Those, those are the things that, that God concerns himself about. You know, there are people that doubt that the Bible is true. And there's believers, they're saved, but everything that God says belongs to us, they say, well, I don't know where that belongs to me. You know, all that stuff stopped when the last uh, uh, apostle, when the last disciple of Jesus died. And other things. The Bible doesn't say that. There's nowhere in the Bible you can find that it says those things cease. They, 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 they don't cease. They continue on. Why? Because God is for us and with us. You know, the Bible says that God's not given us the spirit of fear. When you got born again, God gave you a brand new spirit. You had the spirit of fear. But God gave you the spirit of faith, amen, that you can be a person of faith and you can resist the enemy. Now, that doesn't mean fear won't come. You know, fears come. You got a diagnosis from the doctor, what, what happens, a bad one? Well, immediately the devil says, you know, you might as well go by the funeral home and pick out your casket because you're going to die. Well, the Bible says you have to resist the enemy. See, that's a mistake a lot of Christians make. They think, well, I know the Lord will heal me, and one of these days when I have the manifestation, I know I'm healed. God declares in His Word that when we pray, we have to believe we receive those things, even though we don't have them yet. You have to resist fear. Fear will come, but it can't build a home in your life if you resist it because the Bible says the devil will flee from you. You have to resist the fears. Fear of death. You know, the devil, the Bible says, the devil lorded it over humanity all along. That, that death, death, death. Well, we're all going to die at some point in time. But when I leave here, I'm going into the presence of the Lord. If you're a believer, you're going to the presence of the Lord. You know, death is not something that we fear. There's nobody in a hurry to die. But, but when we leave, we're, we're going to leave this body behind, but we won't cease to exist. We're going to enter the presence of the Lord. We're, we're going to enter all those things we read about. And the day is coming when the trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to be changed in a moment and a twinkle of an eye. In every grave all over the world, the sea's going to give up its dead. Everybody that was a believer is going to be raised up. Their body's going to be raised up. Well, how's that going to happen? You know, I'm watching a program yesterday, and uh, they, they were digging in these graves, and uh, they'd been in a parking lot, and they found this grave, and it's all powder. Powder. Well, how's God going to bring that together? He's God. He will recreate our body, and it's not going to be this old, tired, worn-out body. We're going to have a new body. What are we going to look like? We're going to look like Him when He does appear. We're going to be like the Lord. But until that day, we, we stand for the Lord. We stand against fear. We stand against doubt. See, a lot of people are thinking, when I, when I have all those symptoms leave, I'll know that I'm healed. Brother Hagen, years ago, was a 16-year-old kid, finally figured out, if I'm healed, I'm healed. The Bible says I'm healed. Well, he was paralyzed. It took him forever to slide off the bed and hold himself up with a pole. And the devil said, aren't you a wonderful sight? You say you heal? Well, he said, you know, I didn't have any strength in my legs. He said, I'm holding myself up with a bedpost. But the power of God, because he said, I'm the heel. The power of God uh, covered him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet and received strength. Received enough strength, he dressed himself. And he went in uh, at lunchtime and his grandpa said, are the dead raised? Because he'd been, uh, been on the bed, uh, sick bed of affliction for, for uh, about a year and a half. But God healed him. Well, all that time he'd cried, he'd prayed, he'd believed God. But you see, it takes some effort on our part. And, and though he didn't look well to anybody, he got up and he said, I'm the heel. Well, the devil said, no, you're not. You know, you still, he said, I still had all the symptoms in my body. Uh, he said, my heart wasn't beating right. And he said, I knew those diseases were there. But he said, I'm healed because the Word says I'm healed. And, and because of that, God gloriously healed him. And he had uh, uh, many, many years of ministry uh, to teach people faith. See, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. 
I got to hurry. In Matthew 12, 43, it says, When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he said, I'll return unto my house whence I came out. When he has come, he findeth it empty and swept and garnished. He goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. If you allow fear into your life, fear will invite some friends to come along with him and cause chaos in your life. See, a lot of the chaos that happens in our life is a result that we've left the door open to the devil somehow. Maybe it was unintentional, but we left the door open. You know, we can grumble and complain about things, but God is not a big fan of grumbles and complainers. You know, in the, in, in the desert, the, the, will, uh, the wilderness, the, the Israelites began to complain, and God withdrew. And when they did, the enemy came in. You know, it's the book of Job tells the story of Job. And Job was a devout man. And, and, and the Bible says one day that, that there, there's a, the, the angels of God coming in, and Satan comes in, and he said, Where you been? He said, I've been walking up and down the earth. He said, Well, have you seen my, my servant Job? Yeah, I saw him, but you've got a hedge about him. I can't touch him. Well, the Lord gave him some information he didn't have. He said, Well, if he's in the earth, you're the, you're the God of the world. He's in your authority. Now, God didn't commission the devil. Some people think that. That God commissioned the devil to go over and, and bring all that sickness and disease upon uh, Job, but that didn't happen. You know, we find the answer to the problems that Job had. It is that, that Job said this, Job 3.25, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is coming to me. God did not commission the attack. That Job tore the hedge that God built around him because of his fear. He opened the door and the devil came in. And, and he killed his kids, and he killed his livestock, and he put sickness and disease on him, and, and, and had all these friends come over that were Job's sympathizers trying to figure out what Job had done wrong. Well, the thing he did wrong is he allowed fear to control his life. And, and fear, fear is not the spirit of God. Fear is an enemy. But, but he, he was worried about his kids, and so what he did, he did out of fear. Oh, if I don't do that, you know, the Lord's law will get me. You know, that's no way to serve God. You know, you know these musicians don't come and, and play their instruments because they're afraid if I don't, you know, God will, will strike me down with some disease. They come because they love to worship God. They, they come because they have a desire to worship God with a musical instrument or sing. I can't sing and I don't play a musical instrument. But they come not out of, out of reverential fear. See, there's a difference. When you reverence the Lord and you respect Him, then, then you respect God. You know, a better word be respect and not fear. We respect God. We reverence Him. That's why we do the things we do. We don't fear God uh, like you would fear a rattlesnake. We, we love the Lord, and God loves us. And so it was in Ecclesiastes 10 and 8, it says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whosoever breaketh a hedge, a serpent will bite him. See, Job tore the hedge about him down with his fear, and the devil came in and attacked him. And God turned his captivity. God had to come down and, and tell Job, stand on your feet and begin to prophesy, and I will honor your word. And, uh, you know, those friends, he said, you can forgive your friends for the things they said about you. And, and God turned his captivity. Why? Because he stood on his feet and began to prophesy. See, if you will begin to stand on your feet, so to speak, and you'll declare what the Word says about you, the devil will flee from you. And you know, sickness comes, no, 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 I've been redeemed from the curse. See, sickness is a part of the curse of the law. I've been redeemed from sickness because Jesus, at, at Calvary on his way to Christ, he bore stripes that were on my healing. We have to shut the door to the devil. We have to close the door. We have to close the door, close the windows, because we're shut in with the Lord. That, that we don't open the door to the devil. And if we have any doors open, you know, you know, one of the things is, is unforgiveness. I, you know, and, and Jesus talks about prayer. He talks about to believe what you receive and you're having. But he goes on to say that if we have ought against any, 
that we're to forgive them because if we don't, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive you. In other words, if you had a grudge against somebody and you, you're holding that grudge, you, you know, it's like drinking a poison yourself to make somebody else sick. It don't work that way. Uh, there's a minister uh, that I knew. He was talking about he went to pastor this church and, and a lady came to him and said, well, you might as well know, pastor, right now that, that I don't get along with sister so-and-so. And, uh, you know, well, he thought it was something that happened, you know, recently. He said, well, how long ago did this happen? He said, she said, 20 years ago. She'd been holding a grudge. The other lady probably forgotten all about the instance. You know, it is that a grudge will nullify our prayers. You, you can't afford a grudge. The Bible says forgive. Well, I don't want to forgive them. Well, do it by faith. Forgive them and release them and forget about it because God has forgiven you of all your sins. You know, if we had to confess all our sins, we couldn't do it because you couldn't remember all your sins. You know, I probably did things like five or six years old I forgot about. It. But God forgave me of all those things. God will forgive you. God wants you to be able to shut the door on the devil. So that means that you don't need to be fearful. You don't need to be a doubter. And you don't, you, you don't want to hold a grudge against anybody. You want to shut those doors. And there may be some other errors in your life that you need to shut because it's, it's a way that the devil comes in. You know, we've, we've had people that have said in these services that they've let the devil come into their life and, and mess up their life. They opened the door and the devil came in. And not, not only the devil, he brought some friends with him and, and their life's a mess simply because they didn't shut the door to the devil. We need to close the door. You know, we live in a time, I'm going to say this in close, we live in a time of great fear. People are afraid today. People do something, somebody says something, they just jump and do it without thinking. Why? Because there's a spirit of fear. People are fearful today. But we're not the fearful. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk this Christian walk because the law can't save you. The grace of God saves us. The grace of God delivers us. And God is faithful. If we'll do what he says, then he's faithful to his word. You know, the Bible says he's faithful to a thousand generations. That's a lot of folks. That's a lot of generations. But God is faithful. That means that God is always faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Stand to your feet. We're going to pray. And if you have prayer needs today, we, we'll receive that in faith and pray for you. Now, there will be folks that will watch us by YouTube, and so for the advantage of those, we're going to do this together. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's simple. For with the heart or your spirit, we believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. God didn't make it hard to be saved. Belonging to a church does not save you. Church attendance does not save you. Being baptized in water does not save you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ saves you. That's what God is looking for. And when you receive Jesus, you receive the sacrifice that he that he gave for your life. He shed his blood for you that you might be redeemed. So let's say this together. Heavenly Father, I come in the mighty name of Jesus and I ask you today to come into my heart. I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I believe from my heart that Jesus was crucified for me. I accept your love and forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that from the heart, you're a believer. You're born again. And everything that's in that book, every promise that God made belongs to you. It belongs to you as a child of God. You've inherited the blessings of the Lord. God's blessing come upon you. That doesn't just mean you get to go to heaven. That's wonderful to go to heaven. But God will bless you in the here and now. God will bless you physically, financially. He will bless you in every way. Amen.